and welcome to our Shazam Police Special. Here we are backstage at Auckland's Western Spring Stadium, where in just a few moments, police will be rocking to a crowd of 40,000 people. But first, let's go back 24 hours to when the police first arrived at Auckland's International Airport. It was very impressive. Um, I'd never seen it before. A little intimidating. <laughs> yes, it's, but... <laughs> it's the first time you've had anything like this. Uh, yeah. Because you travelled around the world. Have you, have you, is there anything equal to this? Or Hawaiian welcomes and things like that? No, no, this is the most impressive. All right, well, good luck for the concert. We'll, we'll see you later. We will let Bye bye. <laughs> the police are safely in Auckland. And after flying in direct from Hawaii, there's nothing that Stu, Andy and Sting want to do more than get to their hotel and get some rest. Tomorrow is the big night, and 40,000 police fans will be expecting them to turn on another stunning performance. Next morning, the guys are up bright and early, soaking up the sun around the hotel pool. What a life. The concert is still eight hours away. Andy, welcome to New Zealand. Thank you. Police are now the world's number one rock attraction. You recently broke the audience records at New York Shea Stadium, which was held previous, previously, I think, by the Beatles. Do you ever think it was going to get this big? Well, I guess not really. I mean, I remember the early days when, uh, I guess, Miles used to talk about, you know, being a legend that had sort of, uh, you know, took over from the Beatles and all that. And it seemed very hard to believe anything like that in those uh, early days. But a uh, time came bear and here we are. Yes. We what about, what about now, work. looking back on those early days, what do you think of your early singles? Oh, I think they're great. I still, you know, we still play them obviously on stage and um, I think uh, they were hits because they were as good as they were. I have no, uh, I don't cringe when I hear them, I still enjoy them. I think they had something that uh, is different than what we're doing now. How did you get involved in music? How did I right get involved in music? Uh, I guess the feeling was always there. I mean, Specifically, I was given a guitar when I was about 14, and that was it. I never looked back. Did you have to be forced into learning to play the guitar, or did no, you just do I it? No, I was obsessional the minute I got one. Never did anything else. Easy to play? No, I spent about six months like learning how to uh, get the uh, top string in tune and before I got anywhere at all. I was a slow starter, but once I got the hang of it, I've done OK. You played, the band played all the instruments on synchronicity. Is yeah. that, is it difficult to reproduce that sound on stage? Yeah, but um, it wasn't so much with this album because this album was uh, much more of a three-piece group than, say, the previous one. The last one, uh, Ghost of the Machine, had saxophone and things on it, but at that point, although we didn't come to New Zealand with that particular lineup, we were using uh, three brass players on stage. Um, but our attitude is that we never really try to reproduce our records on stage. We play, we just take the song and, and make a good live performance of them. And we have no uh, qualms about changing the performances entirely from the record. So what's the lineup of, of the on-stage police? Well, it's the three of us. Uh, 
and uh, three uh, girl backing singers at the moment. Edna Holt, who's one of the three backing singers for the police, how did you get involved with them, Edna? Well, they say dreams do come true. I was singing uh, with the Talking Heads last August in Montreal. In fact, we opened up for the police. And they saw me and another girl who I sang with, and they asked us, you know, to come with them. And at the time, I said no. <laughs> but when they asked me again, I said, OK. <laughs> So I got with them in January. So what's it like on the road with the police then? Do you enjoy it? It's real nice. The fellas are real, real nice, you know, down to earth. And it's a lot of fun. You're saying that you're a music teacher back home. <laughs> uh, what, um, how's life on the road compared to being a music teacher? How do you manage to fit it in? Um, I'm a substitute music teacher, so I can get leaves of absence, you know. Um, Life on the road is fun, except like after so many months, like if I was on the road one time almost a year, it gets tiring, you know. But every time you get up on the stage, you forget the tiredness. Police have grabbed the attention of the rock world in a vice-like grip over the past eight years. They are undoubtedly one of the most popular and hardest working rock bands, and bass guitarist leader Sting has become a sex symbol with few challenges. Sting is a fully qualified teacher, but how did he join the police force? We met uh, in London at a studio session, uh, um, session musicians, and um, for someone else's record, we decided that uh, the three of us should get together and become a group. What about music in general for yourself? Um, did it start at an early age? Were you sort of interested right from the very beginning? Yeah, I've always been uh, musical in the sense that uh, there were instruments around the house and I always managed to be able to knock a tune out, as they can say. Um, and that carried on throughout my entire life. So, uh, I don't you got a musical to... family? My mother's a very good pianist. She, uh, she was a classical pianist. Right. And what about the big break? What about the police's big break? When did that arrive? Can you remember the day when you suddenly thought, oh, look, it's happening now? Um, no, it wasn't like that. It was, it was a series of little, little jumps. The first one was um, having the opportunity to make a record, which uh, in those days was quite difficult. So we, we borrowed the money to make a record, and uh, that was a little jump, success. And then when we heard it on the radio, that was another big right. moment. We thought we made it there. Just one, one play on the radio was enough to please us. And then when we actually got on the charts, that was another wonderful experience. And then to be number one with not only a single, but an album. So the whole thing was, was an adventure every step of the way. broke the audience records at the Shea Stadium in New York, held by the Beatles. Did you ever think it was going to get this big? No, it wasn't my intention to become this big, as you call it. It was merely my intention to play music um, to please myself. Uh, getting big is a side effect of enjoying oneself. Are you pleasing yourself? Yes, to a large extent. I think um, what we do is very enjoyable, and when it uh, seems to make other people enjoy themselves too. It, it's twice the reward in a sense. What do you think when you look back on your, on your old singles? Do you, do you still enjoy listening to them or...? I don't often listen to the old <laughs> records. Really? Why? I don't know. Um, I think I probably will when I, when I get older, but it's, it seems to be the recent past, you know, that it might as well be ancient history. Are you still learning from your old singles? From my old songs? Yeah. We still perform them on stage, you know, and they're obviously very different to the way that they were recorded initially because we're different people than we were then. We're more sophisticated. Uh, I think we're better musicians, better performers. So in a sense, um, yeah, yeah, I think we've learned a lot. As they've gone, have become much more of a director's art. They're very slick. They're, the editing is very fast, and they've, they've become more of a director's art rather than the groups. 
um, to the group's detraction some of the time, I think. But uh, I think our current uh, crop from the uh, Synchronicity album are more in that vein. We've worked with uh, two very talented guys called Godley and Krem, who used to be musicians in a group called 10CC. And um, they're so creative with their ideas that we've not had to um, have so much of our own original thinking in the videos. We've been very happy to uh, go with those guys, although obviously we do participate and we still have to perform in the videos themselves, but um, we're very happy working with them. We just shot um, an entire live concert, which is um, being shown in America with those two guys. What about uh, effects, lights? Um, we're fairly basic in our, in our use of uh, what I call peripheral entertainment as far as lighting goes, but it, it is very impressive. In fact, uh, we've been complimented on uh, having the best light show ever, in a sense, but there are no flying gorillas or <laughs> giant tortoises, you know, and none of those sort of gimmicks. I, th I think that tends to detract from the music. Western Springs Stadium is in for a night which it will never forget. Before the concert is through, hundreds of non-paying police fans will gate-crash the show with dozens being arrested, leaving a huge question mark hanging over the future of rock concerts at the Springs. But an hour before showtime, there is no hint of the trouble to come. Stuart, welcome to Shazam. Well, thank you very much. Nice to have you along. What you've got? What? An hour to go before you're on stage. What, what sort of things do you go through at this? I mean, you seem very relaxed. Well, I'm wondering if I got my laundry in at the hotel on time. And uh, I haven't got enough time to order room service yet. From here? From No, not before the show. And, um... What about nerves? You get nervous There's a bird now? flying up there. Um, Brian Adams sounded pretty good, and I'm looking forward to seeing Australian Crawl. What about nerves? Do you still get nerves? Before a no, I, I um, have learned that I can get more power out of my performance if I vegetate beforehand. Right. In fact, my whole body goes into kind of involuntary re relaxation before a show. Right. I feel like weak as a kitten, and I will feel weaker and weaker and weaker as we get closer to the show, and then I walk on stage like King Kong. <laughs> <laughs> now, the drummer of a band like Police uh, obviously has to go through an incredible amount of strength to keep going all the time. How do you, how do you keep it up? Why? I mean, you're not a particularly sort of what, enormous if it, guy. If I didn't play drums, I'd be a complete weed, you know. <laughs> it's what uh, keeps me fit. And uh, that's all I have to do is just play play my drums, and that keeps me fit. There's no, there's no you know, sort of worry. Oh, I have to do um, three hours a day of kinetic ritual, breathing exercises, uh, cathartic exercises as well, you know shouting, stabbing, you know, breaking furniture and things like that. Yeah. It's good for the tranquility of the spirit. How long does it take you to calm down after? The after the kinetic ritual. <laughs> no, A good plate concert. of spaghetti will do it, <laughs> you know. After the concert? It depends. Sometimes um, after a concert, I just curl up into a catatonic position and have to be taken home and somebody has to read me a bedtime story and stuff. Oh, and other times after the show, I'm King Kong for like three hours afterwards, and then I start to unwind. Now, you were out today. Was it playing polo or just watching polo? Uh, no, I was playing. It was a good game. How did you get involved with that? Uh, well, I played when I was a kid. Uh, and then uh, when I became a starving musician, I stopped playing. And I didn't play for many years until I became a rich musician, whereupon I took it up again. Today has been a very hairy day for the promoter. I think our promoter has got a few gray hairs today. We all had our fun today. While I was facing death on the polo field, uh, Sting went parachuting on the back of a boat, you know. And the wind was so strong today that the boat stopped and he didn't come down. The wind just kept him up. So there's Sting stuck up a parachute and can't come down. And Andy went out on a, a, um, a catamaran today and the rudder fell off. And Andy's heading out to sea with his, without a rudder and Sting's up a parachute. And I'm, on, and I'm on, and I'm, I'm in the charge of the light brigade. <laughs> Leonie, can I bother you a second? I know you're very <laughs> busy. So. You're the publicity and promotions organizer for the police tour. Is it hectic setting up this sort of thing? 
Yes, definitely hectic. I'm very tired and been asleep for about three days, but it's exciting and rewarding. You organise the David Bowie concerts here in New Zealand. How do you find the big overseas stars to work with? Are they difficult at all? Sometimes difficult. The bigger they are, the easier they are to work with. Um, Bowie was fairly quiet, nice gentleman. Uh, the police are a little bit more crazy, but they're enjoyable. One rule at big concerts is no illegal taping of performances. Why is there a total ban on filming and recording? I think that's understandable, really. They end up with tapes around the world that they have no control of. Often they're bad tapes as well. But I'm sorry, Phil, I'll have to go now. OK. Uh, the board's going on stage. Thanks for your time. Bye. 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 been one of New Zealand's most controversial concerts. The majority of the 40,000 rock fans agree that it's been a night to remember. But how long can police go on pounding the beat? There have been rumours that the, uh, the police are sort of nearing the end of their relationship. You know, dispel those rumours. Well, these rumours are, you know, are put about by um, journalists you know, who want to make up a story. I mean, wh whether there's any basis of fact in, in them, it's not for me to say. <laughs> I mean, what, what happens to the group is, is, is in our minds. It's not, uh, you know, it's not going to be propagated by what they say in the papers or on television. Well, we've all had stabs at sidelines in the uh, last year, so I had a photograph book out, which has been very successful, called Throb. And I also had a, made an album with Robert Fripp. Um, I'm just going back straight from Australia to uh, make another record with Robert Fripp which will be out in June, I guess, and uh, then I'm making a movie. So let's talk a little bit about your, your latest venture, Rumblefish. Yes. What do you, what do you, what do you actually do there? What did I do? Mm. I composed and performed and produced the music. This and, is uh, for a movie, is it? It's for a movie. It's a movie by Francis Ford Coppola um, called Rumblefish, and it's about um, a sweaty, steamy town in the south of America. It's kind of the southwest called Tulsa. Tulsa, Oklahoma. I'm very ambitious musically, you know. I mean, I'm still learning as a musician. I haven't sort of said, oh, well, I'm, I'm good at this. I'm, I don't get any better. I'm actually getting better all the time because I practice, you know. But uh, yes, I do have large scale ambitions musically too. Are you going to tell us what they are? No, it would sound, <laughs> it would sound preposterous on the television. All right. Sting, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Good luck with the, uh, with the screenplay. I hope we see it over here. Shazam. That's right.